Morning. How are we doing? Good. 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 Glad to hear it. Uh, glad to be with you guys this morning. Uh, if this is your first Sunday at Aletheia, I think I could say the name of the church that I helped plant uh, correctly, right? Uh, this is your first Sunday at Aletheia. Welcome. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here. We're glad you're here uh, with us this morning. Um, isn't Jesus the best? Amen. Uh, if you guys would just do something for me, we just give a round of applause to the band. They worked. Yeah. They have, uh, they've been working really hard for you guys, and our, if you guys don't know our drummer, he's like on death's door uh, with a man cold this morning, so, um, and I know because I had it earlier in the week, and it's terrible, so, and he's powering through for you guys this morning, so you can have some hot beats in the background of your music, so uh, I wouldn't recommend hugging him, but you can pray for him um, so that he can get through the remainder of the set, uh, and then pray over this TV this morning as well as Satan has taken over. Uh, the HDMI cable uh, there. So um, I love this time of year other than the cold. And one of the reasons I moved to Florida was to get away from this. And for some reason, it's found its way down here um, today. Um, but this time of year is, is, is really, at least for us here in the U.S., right, probably a time where like a lot of memories start flooding back in and things that you remember from, from growing up. And we've got Thanksgiving coming up in a few weeks, um, Black Friday, which might not be so great for those of you that love to shop. Maybe you love that. Um, and then Christmas, right? And, and good and bad pieces of memories that you probably built over the years with family and friends and things uh, during this time of year, both the good and bad. I was thinking as we were getting ready to head into our new series here, heading into Christmas, um, that one of the things that makes this time of year, I think, so special is just the traditions that get started over the years that, that you've probably experienced with uh, your family. Uh, some of your favorite family moments, and I've shared this story before, but I'm going to go ahead and share it again because I love it. Uh, but every year, my family during Christmas time was we had a few traditions that we would do every single year. Part of those was Christmas Eve was spent at my grandmother's house and we would go out for the Christmas Eve service at her church, and then afterwards we would stay up really late as kids and open presents, and it was just great. I mean, there was like nine grandkids in the room, and the room was just pure chaos, and it was awesome. We just were drowning in a sea of uh, wrapping paper, and we loved it. And I always am really fond of remembering those memories, but one particular um, thing that my family did every year is we lived in Virginia, and so we would go to these places where you could go out to a farm and pick a live Christmas tree. And you would go out in the cold with snow on the ground, and you would take, you'd get, get there, and they'd hand you a saw, and you'd go out there. I mean, the whole thing makes no sense, right? Here, do all the work and then pay us for this tree that you cut down from our property, right? But you would walk out, you would cut a tree down, right? And then you'd take it back, and, and, and you would take it home, and you would decorate it. And I always love Jim Gaffigan's one of my favorite comedians. He always has this, he has this line in one of those. He's like, it sounds like the behavior of someone that struggles with alcohol, not the behavior of a sane human being to take a tree from outside your house, bring it in the house, and then decorate it, and he's kind of right. Um, but that's what we do, right? Because it's a tradition that we've had for, for generations and generations. Uh, but one year when I was young, I remember uh, us picking out a tree, and we tied it to the top of our old white Plymouth van. I don't think Plymouths exist anymore. And, and when we got home, my uncle and my dad would do this together every year. It was kind of like a trade-off of helping one another get these trees into the home. And one year, my, my uncle was helping my dad into the house and I should probably give a little bit of a disclaimer here as I'm telling this story. Uh, Anderson men have a reputation for um, losing their temper very, very quickly when things aren't going well. And so my dad has this tree, and he's, uh, he's, he's at our front door, and he has picked a tree too large for the size of our home and the door frame into our home. And most of you guys don't know my mom. She visits every once in a while. She's like the sweetest lady on the face of the earth. And, and she's, I mean, she has to be. She's put up with my dad for 40 years almost at this point. And so she, who, she loves her kids and she sees us standing there with my cousins. You know, she's trying to bring light to the situation as this is supposed to be a joyous occasion where we're making memories together that we're going to last a lifetime. And she's not wrong. It did. It lasted a lifetime. I'm never going to forget this. And as my dad is flipping out, screaming um, obscenities at this tree that is a tree, so it's not going to talk back to him, right? My mom's like, hey, it's okay. Like, we'll just figure it out. We can take it back. We can get a new one. And my dad, I'll never forget this. He turns in a fit of rage. He looks at my mom and says, 
either this tree fits through this doorway or this doorway gets widened, but it's Christmas and this tree is going in. I cleaned up a lot of pine needles after, <laughs> but that tree did somehow make it in. And as I was thinking there, I was like, why do we, why do we get this way around the holidays? Why, why do we fight so hard for these traditions? And I think that one of the things that I think we, we can kind of process through and, and think through is like sometimes uh, traditions can be good and sometimes they can be bad. Or sometimes they can be instituted for the right reasons and sometimes for the, for the wrong reasons. I think traditions oftentimes can be good things when they are created to help us reflect and remember the importance of something and to remember that thing fondly and, and enjoy that. And then at other times, they can become just another rhythm or practice that we've allowed into the space and rhythm of our lives where it's not necessarily helpful or reminding us of why we did it in the first place. You know, uh, there, there can be good rhythms and traditions that remind us of things we need to be reminded of, and there can be bad ones. Like I, when I think about Christmas, right, there are lots of good traditions my family has, and then I also remember that, that we shop a lot, we eat a lot, we spend a lot, and we get a lot, and we rest a lot. And are all those rhythms and traditions what God might want of me as one of his sons who's living out the implications of the gospel in my life here on earth. And so this morning, right, we are starting a new series um, that is rooted in tradition. It's entitled Advent Conspiracy. We started it last year. Uh, and so I, I want to spend just a few minutes this morning explaining to you what Advent is. If you don't know what it is, disclaimer, I understand that by, on the church calendar, if you come from a traditional church background, that Advent does not start till December 1st. I get it. I also know that we live in a city where 95% of you will be out of this town on like December 18th. And we wanted to get through the entire series before you leave. And so we're starting it today. And there's nothing you can do about it, right? So at our church, right, thank you, right? Whoever clapped, thank you, right? So for, for our purposes, Advent starts today, right? And we're just going to extend it a little bit longer, right, into the Christmas season. For those of you Ebenezer Scrooges in here who are mad about anything Christmas coming up on your radar before Thanksgiving, get over it, okay? Right? Like Christmas is fine. One of those elders who's under discipline in our church, Derek, is is grumpy about this, and that's okay. Right? He's he's gonna be excommunicated and it's gonna be fine. Right? It's gonna be it's gonna be just fine, buddy. Right? <laughs> so simply put though, what is Advent? Advent is the season, right, that the church observes leading up to Christmas. That's, that's kind of like, to, in layman's terms, to put it simply, that's what it's supposed to be. And the purpose of this season in church history is that the church would spend time in the weeks leading up to Christmas Day reflecting on this truth, that there was a period in time that God, God's people for thousands of years longed for the coming salvation that God had promised them. Where for thousands of years, God's people longed for the Messiah to arrive on the scene and rescue God's people. Peter actually shares this truth with us in 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to turn over there and I'm going to read this to you. Uh, starting in verse 10, listen to what he says. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So here's what Peter's saying there. Even prophets who gave us right, the prophecies of who Jesus was, what we should be looking for in the Messiah, even those prophets longed to see what we now have experienced and know as reality about the coming of Jesus Christ. That for thousands of years, they longed for Jesus to show up on the scene. And so Advent is a, a season where, and Advent just means coming. Advent is a season where the church gathers together, right, to historically kind of spend time focusing on worshiping God for actually having sent Jesus, 
Like, hey, hey, in, in the past, right, our ancestors longed for the arrival of Jesus. And now that is a felt reality that we, we can know because Christ has come, he has lived, and he has died in our place and rose again. That there's the reality of, of Christmas of celebrating the incarnation of Jesus Christ and enjoying that to the glory of God. But the second thing we do is this. The church comes together and looks forward to the second coming of Jesus as well. That in this Advent, we long for the, uh, the arrival of Jesus and celebrating that both in his first coming, but we also long for his second coming. Now, some of you may be sitting there and saying, okay, that's fine, good. I know it's not Christmas time, but okay, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bear with you starting in the middle of November instead of December when you're actually supposed to start on this. But why call it Advent Conspiracy? So uh, this is something that Pastor Daniel brought to us from his church from when he was out in Seattle, uh, and it's based on a book that a couple of pastors heading into the Advent se- uh, season years and years ago just kind of said, like, we feel like our churches don't get it, and we don't know how to help encourage them to focus properly on God in this season. How can we do that? And so they called it Advent Conspiracy, and I want to read just the intro of their book to you, and if you're interested in it, you can buy the book off of Amazon. It's really good, but let me just, the way the book is set up is it's set up around four kind of key principles, and there's a few chapters for each principle to help you kind of process through and think through as you're heading through the Advent season. But let me just read the, the intro to you. It says, over a decade ago, a few pastors were lamenting how they'd come to the end of an Advent season, exhausted and sensing that they'd missed it. The awe-inducing, soul-satisfying mystery of the incarnation of Jesus. For many of us, we were drowning in a sea of financial debt and endless lists of gifts to buy. We struggled to find the connection between our Christmas to-do lists and the story of Jesus' birth. An overwhelming stress had overtaken worship and celebration. The time of year when focusing on Christ should be the easiest was often the hardest. Somehow, this had become the new normal. So in 2006, three pastors, Chris C., Greg Holder, and Rick McKinley, decided to try something different. They called it Advent Conspiracy Movement and came up with four tenets, and those tenets were these, worship fully, spend less, give more, and love all to help guide themselves, their families, and their congregations through the Christmas season, right? So this is the, the point behind why we're doing this, is to kind of focus our hearts, to focus our minds in on the true purpose of the season, because the reality, guys, is that, that we will leave this place, and you guys are going to have 30 different things vying for your attention, your time, and your affections throughout the next month and a half, between family, between presents, between gifts, between exams, between working with people on vacation and having to do more work than usual, between taking your own vacation through travel, there's going to be a ton of things and distractions in the coming weeks and months. And our goal over the next few weeks will be to to cover these four tenets and commit to living these out as a church to make Christmas what it really is all about, and that's worshiping Jesus. So that's our goal. If we, if, if we see a greater worship of Jesus swelling up in our church over the next couple weeks and months, we will have been successful. And so this morning, here's the tenet we're going to focus on, and it's based upon Psalm 150, and that's worshiping fully, right? Focusing fully. So do me a favor. If you're a note taker, you can write this down. But if you're a note taker, answer this question for me. If you had to say, what is your favorite part about the Christmas season what would you say? What would be the first thing that pops into your mind? Just think about that for a second. Maybe it's gifts. Maybe it's seeing family that you don't get to see very often. Uh, Maybe if it's like for me, not seeing family that you don't want to drive up into the cold Arctic tundra of Virginia and suffer with, and that you just stay home and eat Chinese food in the evening, right? That's our tradition that I love and am not interested in changing anytime soon. Jackie's always rolling her eyes. Um, maybe it's time off work. Maybe it's the temperature change. But how many of you guys, when, if you were honest with yourselves, when I asked that question, you wrote down that it was a greater opportunity to worship Jesus, 
to reflect on him, to reflect on his goodness, to reflect on what he has done for us. But the reality is, is that Christmas, right, designed in the, in the church calendar, right, by the Romans, right, was designed to get God's people to remember and reflect and worship God during this season, specifically centered around the incarnation and the fact that Jesus had come. Um, if you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 2 with me. I want to read to you from there. Right? And many of you guys are probably familiar with this story. I mean, this is the story that you hear every Christmas. People love Luke's account because he actually explains right, Jesus' birth. But starting in verse 8, look at what Luke says. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Right, so most of the time when we read that story, right, we, we, we get pulled into some of like the, the details, right? We get pulled into the details of the fact that, hey, angels just showed up and started talking to these random shepherds outside of Bethlehem, right? We get pulled into the details of what Mary was doing or where the shepherds went. But I want you to think about this, right? Jesus, Jesus has just been born. Many of us know this story. And what is the pattern response of the, of the characters listed in Luke's account, what is their response to Jesus' birth? Worship. Right? Look, look closely. Right? The angels break out in song, worshiping God for what he has done. The shepherds then, as an act of worship, leave their sheep, which, by the way, guys, I just want you to think about this for a second. This is their economic livelihood. And in an act of worship, they leave and they go into town to worship this baby who's just been born. And then it says that even Mary pondered and treasured all of these things in her heart. Which brings us back to our text then in Psalm 150, right? That Jesus is born and we see this consistent pattern immediately upon his birth of, of just worship. People are just excited about Jesus being on the scene and that God is finally uh, bringing into reality this long-awaited Messiah that had been promised who would save God's people. And so when we get to Psalm 150, right, as you heard Leah read earlier, right, this is just a song where David, right, is, is crying out to the people, hey, we just need to give God the glory and the praise and the honor that he is due. That, that, is, that is our job. That is, that is the reason we exist, that we just need to be exalting the Lord. And as I, as I prepared for this sermon, right, one of the things I found really interesting is that if you read the Old Testament, there are seven different words used for the word praise in the Old Testament, okay? 
Uh, the first one is the law, which means we just, we just praise with shouts, right? The second one is zamar, right? And if any of you guys are Hebrew scholars, feel free to correct my Hebrew. My Hebrew is truly terrible. I did well in Greek in seminary, not so much so in Hebrew. Uh, but zamar means to praise with instruments and voices. So they're connecting it with certain things. Uh, the third one you'll see is hallelujah, which is calling on others to enter corporate praise. So when we were singing that last song before our time in the word this morning, right, where uh, we sing hallelujah, right, the purpose of placing that into that part of the refrain and the verses of that song is calling us as God's people to join in to lifting up corporately the name of Jesus. Uh, There's the Hebrew word yada, which is lifting our arms up in surrender. So if you're ever worried, if you ever come to church and you see people doing this, that is generationally taught Right? For thousands of years, right, our ancestors have been praising God, and part of that experience was just lifting your hands up in surrender, recognizing God's greatness and glory. Uh, number five is tauda, which is singing praises in community, like having a concert and being willing to sing together corporately. Uh, number six is shabak, which is to reach out to God and to feel his presence, to praise him kind of like as this experiential type of worship internally that you are experiencing. But when you get to Psalm 150, right, right, the word that's used consistently for praise throughout Psalm 150 is the word halal. And it means, that word means to boast foolishly in something. Meaning that it has this idea of if you are so excited about God and who he is and his faithfulness that you are willing to look like a fool, right, to praise God for what he's done. That you're willing to look absolutely crazy. One of my favorite stories in all of scripture is King David, right, showing us exactly what this type of praise looks like. If you've got your Bible, turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 6 with me. I want to share this story with you. This is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. The first two books of the Bible I read as a brand new believer were first and second Samuel. And I remember as a fairly new believer reading this story, being like, what the heck? Like, what king would do this and then allow it to be recorded about him later on down the line? Right? But turn with me to chapter 6 of 2 Samuel and look at what David does starting in verse 14. I'll give you a little bit of background. The nation of Israel has been fighting the Philistines over and over again, and they finally had victory. And one of the things that happened during uh, this time of battle is that the ark had been stolen from them, and it's now being returned to Israel. That's where we're at in the, in the narrative of the story. Right? So starting in verse 14, look at what David says. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all of the household of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a horn. Now I need to tell you something. A linen ephod would would, um, not what we would be, we would describe as a great covering. (laughs) Probably like maybe like, you know, uh, bikini man thong type level of covering, right? He doesn't have a ton of clothes on. Let me just put it that way, right? So He's dancing in the street with a linen ephod on, okay? I'm not telling you to let your mind go there, but that's what we're talking about, okay? Verse 16, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of the hosts. And distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. And David returned to bless his household, But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me above your father. I always love that line, like, God picked me over your dad, sorry. (laughs) Right? Look what he says next. 
and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Psalm 150, guys, is a, a, a call to experience two things. It's, it's a call to praise and enjoy God with the type of reckless abandon that David experiences here of God's faithfulness. Right, the, the, the first thing that Psalm 150 calls us to experience is, is to, like David, be able to say, I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. Right? Mean, meaning, David's saying, like, I don't care if I don't look like a king. I don't care if I look foolish to you. I don't care what you think about me. I am celebrating God's faithfulness to us. He has given us victory over our enemies and he has returned his presence through the Ark of the Covenant to us. I will sing as loud as I possibly can about God's goodness to us and I do not care what you think. And here's what I want you guys to understand as we're heading into Christmas, right? Here, here in this Advent season, right? Here's what, uh, if we wanna see a greater worship of Jesus in our lives, if we wanna see a greater worship of Jesus in the lives of those around us, if we wanna engage and encourage and equip and empower people to love Jesus the way we say we want to as a church, here's something you need to understand. If you're gonna praise God it needs to look a little weird. Now, I'm not saying, you know, go dress like David did and dance around the streets and sing, although I probably wouldn't yell at you, although if you get arrested, I'm not bailing you out. But here's what I am saying, right? I think that as believers, we have a tendency as as a church to say, yeah, I love God, right? I'll wear my cool Christian t-shirt or listen to the Joy FM or whatever it is we think, or you'll put my sticker on my, on my uh, laptop or my, my, my mug or whatever it is that says I'm a Christian, you know, like you know, all the cool things we love to do, right? But here's, here is what I would say in response to that, right? That's not really gonna grab people's attention. Worshiping God and praising him should look different and weird to the world around us. And if you are being accused of being weird by non-believers, that's a good thing. Like it should look foolish to the world around you. And guys, this is actually pretty easy to pull off at Christmas time, right? Like here's something you could do that is an act of worship that would look weird to those around you, not giving into consumerism. That, that is going to look really, really strange to coworkers and classmates, right? Giving out your time to help those that are less fortunate than yourself. Caring about what we give more than what we get. This is the pattern that Jesus showed us in his life. And guess what? It looks pretty crazy to an individualistic highly selfish culture that we all live in and participate in on a daily basis, right? I'm not even, I'm not even saying that you need to like go into to the middle of Turlington Plaza and put your headphones in and just start singing and, and dancing to God, right? I'm saying that you can do even simple things that are gonna be an act of worship that are gonna look weird to those around you. And what we see here in Psalm 150 as 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 they, the, they sing and cry out to God, hey, we're going to look crazy for God. We're going to look crazy in his sanctuary. We're going to praise him in the heavens. We're going to look crazy for that. We're going to look crazy as we shout about his mighty deeds. We're going to look crazy as we shout about his excellent greatness. Uh, we're going to sound crazy because we're just going to blow trumpets. We're just going to make a bunch of noise about how great God is. Uh, we're going to praise him with a lute and with a harp. I don't even know what a lute is. I think it's a, a guitar, right? Someone that knows music, tell me, is that kind of what that is? Sort of, yeah. Okay, thank you, music people, right? They're like, this guy's an idiot. He has no idea what he's talking about right? We're going to praise him with the lute and the harp, right? We're going to dance with a tambourine and dance, right? We're going we're gonna to look crazy with strings and pipe, 
We're going to praise him with cymbals. We're going to make loud clashing cymbals. By the way, I imagine, right, that this noise probably wasn't as uh, organized as what we experience on a Sunday morning. It's probably a little chaotic. It's like walking into my kid's preschool room when they have music time, right? Every kid is smiling, and there is no real music going on. But everyone's having a great time. Let everything that has breath, what? Praise the Lord. Right, the call, right, for followers of God who have experienced the faithfulness and the goodness of God to us through his son, Jesus Christ. This is the call that God has placed in our lives. To worship him with a kind of reckless abandon that doesn't really care about our own reputation or the way we're perceived by those around us. Because the reality is, is that our identity is so wrapped up in Jesus and what he has done for us that it doesn't matter if our name is drugged through the mud because Jesus is better. Right? And so as, as they, they sit here and they praise God, right, the first call that we see there to, to, to worship fully is this idea of getting over ourselves to make much of Jesus. But the second thing we see there in Psalm 150 is this, is that we can grow in our delight and worship of God through song. And, and I, I think this is really interesting as you, as you look through Psalm 150 and you look at the language here. But God is affirming to his people the power of worship through music and how important music can be. Right? He says, praise God right, for his mighty deeds, his excellent goodness towards us. Right? And he says, do it with trumpet and loop and harp uh, lute and harp and tambourine and dance and strings and pipe and cymbals, right? One of the things that like has always struck me, right? And for those of you guys that are dancers, I'm sorry, I've never understood this, right? But when we went to Columbia, right, the first time I ever went, they took us to like some Wednesday night service and Mario's like, okay, I kind of need to let you know that like Colombians, they worship God better than Americans do, <laughs> right? And so like I walk in and like they're already practicing whatever and I look back and there's just some people like just doing and like they were like the hype men for the church, dancing, right? And then people would get up and go back there and dance with them. And I'm like, man, like I have no rhythm. Like, do I just do this? Like, you know, what are we, what are we doing here? But they were living this out. They were living Psalm 150 out right before me, right? And then, then he goes on to say, right, who does this? Everything that has breath should be living out this type of praise towards God, right? In the sanctuary, which means, right, the, this idea of holiness or sacredness towards God. So it's an attitude or a posture of recognizing God's holiness, his power, his goodness, that we worship him with abandon in this. And so let me just say something that I pulled out of this as I was reading through this. God is crazy about us singing songs of worship to him. Like, he likes it. It's a good thing, right? There's a reason why for thousands of years our ancestors have been singing songs together that declared the goodness of God anywhere from old Gregorian chants and hymns to modern-day contemporary worship music, some of which is good and some of it should be kicked to the side and never listened to again. Right, that for thousands of years God has used, right, music to incline the hearts of his people into a posture of worship, right? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31 with me, right? This is, this is if you know anything about Deuteronomy, right? This is, this is Moses' like final sermon to the nation of Israel before, before he dies, right? And look at what he says right towards the end. They're getting ready to enter the promised land. They've just named Joshua as the new commander of the Israeli army. They're getting ready to enter into the promised land and, 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 re, and reflect on God's faithfulness. And look at what God tells them to do. Now, therefore, write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me, despise me and break my covenant. And when many evils and troubles shall have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness 
for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know what they are inclined to do even today before I have brought them into the land that I swore to give them. Do you see what God's saying to Moses here? He's like, hey, teach my people this song because music has a way of convicting us of sin and not being reminded of God's faithfulness to us. Have you guys ever gone to church or gone to a worship service somewhere and started singing the lyrics to a song and been like, I don't believe this? Right, like that, that, that line in that, that famous hymn, right? In Christ alone, my hope is, is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. I, I have found my time, myself at times starting to sing that stanza. I mean, I can't sing this. My, my hope's not being found in Christ alone right now. My hope is being found partially in Christ, but it's also being found in my own worth, uh, my relationships with others, my, my, my financial status, the health of my kids, right? That God uses music, right, both to bring about a worship of him, but part of that experience is being convicted of sin and being drawn to repentance. Right? As, as God shares with Moses that God both draws us to repentance, but he also, right, talks about how he's going to comfort his people on the goodness and his faithfulness to them, right? And there'll be other times where we come in and we've been having a terrible week and we start singing a song and we're like, this is the reminder I needed, right? This is the reminder that I needed that God is good. Then in the midst of whatever storm or sea or craziness is going on around me, Right, I'm a doctor and we're losing, we're losing patients and we gave everything we had and we lost a patient. Or I might lose my job because I screwed up that business deal this past week. Right? Or, or my family is walking through cancer. Right? Or I have no idea what the heck I'm going to do with my life when I graduate here in a few weeks. Right? As you sit in the midst of that, you can come in here and you can start singing and that God would be merciful enough through the power of song to reignite your heart and your passions towards him. Because God can comfort us in this. Now, singing not only encourages us, to re- encourages us to repent and reflect on God's goodness, but singing also helps take head knowledge to heartfelt emotion. Right? And this is one of those important things for me because I tend to always live in my brain and never deal with the emotional side of who God created us to be. Will you throw Colossians 3 up on the TV for me? Right? Paul says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. Right? So as Paul teaches the church on how they are supposed to govern themselves and live out life and how they are supposed to be growing in wisdom and knowledge of God's words. One of the very things he lays out, he's like, as the word of God dwells richly among you, what are some of the things that you should be doing to help encourage that growth? Singing psalms and hymns together. Right, because music, right, is designed right, to help us remember truths about who God is. Now, here's how I know this is a fact. If I asked you guys this week, memorize Colossians 3.16, and when you come in, the way to get into service next week is to tell us what that verse is, I bet 50% of you couldn't do it. But I always use this example because it cracks me up because my wife always says, like, oh, scripture memorization is, like, really hard for me. That woman remembers every line from TLC's No Scrubs. Every line, right? A couple years ago, we were like driving up to Virginia and that song came on a playlist and she's just, you know, she's just going for it. I'm like, this song is like 45 years old. How do you remember this? It's not that old. So, by the way, those of you guys are under the age of 25 have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Go home and listen. Your ears will be in for a treasure. Right, music right, as God has designed it in creation is for our good and his glory, right, that we can sing songs as an act of worship and God is merciful enough to have those songs actually lift high the name of Jesus, but also store spiritual truth in our hearts, 
This is why when we, we talk about Grow, becoming growing disciples and followers of Jesus Christ here at Alathia Church, that some that part of that plan that we create and say, hey, what are we gonna do to stir our affections for God? Is one of the things we say is how how will I grow in God's truth? What things am I gonna do? But also how am I gonna grow and worship? And here's the beautiful thing: sometimes those things overlap and come together. That if we find theologically rich and God-exalting music, we can both grow in knowledge and wisdom of who God is, the way that Paul calls us to in Colossians chapter 3, and yet we can also worship and make much of Jesus at the same time. Guys, this is why church service is set up the way that it is. It's not just designed to be some sort of concert where you guys come in and sing a few popular songs of the day. Right? We're very intentional about this as we want to incline our hearts and our posture to throw out the distractions of the world around us so we might focus in on worshiping our king and making much of him. And so here's how I want to land this as we've been working through Psalm 150 this morning and we're, we're coming back to this idea of, hey, we are entering into this season of Advent where we want to together as a church come together in unity around this idea of worshiping God more fully, around spending less, around giving more, and around loving all. Right? How are, how are we going to do this? Because Christmas is the season where, where you are invited. Right? I think there's two times a year, every year, where culturally here in the United States, you get an opportunity to share the gospel on a much uh, easier level than any other time of year that you have right? Like you are likely to go to church and someone else is likely to go to church during this time period, even if they don't believe in God because grandma makes them go or mom makes them go or it's something that they do and their traditions as a family, right? This is a season where you are invited to tell a story about the goodness and mighty deeds of Jesus Christ and what God has done for us through him. How Jesus is God's act of goodness and faithfulness towards a rebellious and stiff-necked people. How this baby child is worshipped by his mother, by angels, and by shepherds. Because he embodies the fullness of God and his love towards us. If you were to turn Christmas this year you were to turn Advent into an opportunity to see a greater and more full worship of Jesus in your own life, what would that look like? What would that look like personally, and how would that affect those around you? What, what would it do? What would, what would it create? I mean, maybe it's simple. Maybe you're someone like me who can't carry a tune, but you're just going to start singing Christmas songs anyway. And someone's like, dude, you can't sing. And God says, raise a joyful noise to the Lord. I'm assuming it's joyful to him. And one day, when all things are made new, I will be able to hit that high C <laughs> and not change keys. Jackie's dying laughing right now because that's what I do. I'm like, singing, 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 change keys because I can't hit that in the regular key that I'm in, right? One day, right, we know that God is going to make all things new, and I'm going to sing about how a baby being born in a manger in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago is the reason that I can stand here and celebrate today. Whether you believe in him or not, the course of human history was altered because of this baby, and I'm going to, I'm going to sing a song about him. I don't care. Maybe, maybe it's another shift. Maybe it's a shift in how you invest your time. Maybe it's going to be a shift in how you invest your money. Maybe, maybe you can care for somebody. Maybe the best gift you can give a coworker this Christmas season is helping take care of their kids so they can go Christmas shopping. Maybe it's taking care of a sick, a sick loved one so that someone else can have a break. Maybe it's just simply giving your time. I mean, like I, a couple weeks ago, I was up in Virginia because a friend of mine was getting married, and I, I, sp I spent, I was very intentional, I spent two full days with my grandmothers. And like my grandmothers always said, already said to me, she sent me a text, don't bring anything, I just want to see you again when you come up here in a, in a few weeks. Because right? 
they're on, they're on the back end of their life. They know that now. You know, they're in their 80s and in their 90s. They want to spend time. As much as my grandmother loves her Kindle, she wanted to spend more time with me. Or maybe you can just give some time. But how can you take this season and be intentional with it in your worship of Jesus and as an act of worship, invite someone else to worship Jesus as well? I can't answer that question for you. I, I really can't. I can give you ideas, but I, I can't answer that question for you. Right? God is uniquely and individually working in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit, but he wants to use you to see a greater worship of Jesus during this season, not only in your life, but in the lives of those around you. And, and let's just let's be honest. How different would Christmas look if we did this? I remember a couple years ago, Christians love to get angry about the stupidest stuff, right? And like because I've been in the church long enough now, I'm Facebook friends with a lot of them. And every Christian that I knew from back home was angry that Starbucks didn't put Merry Christmas on a, on a Starbucks cup. Believe it or not, I doubt God's angry about that. Could be, I don't know. I, 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 but I doubt God, as we're getting our caffeine, is like, you didn't worship me enough on the cup. I, I, I highly doubt. By the way, if I'm wrong, I will stand before the Lord one day and receive any judgment that I, I deserve for saying this right now. You know what God probably does care about? It's if you're kind enough to be generous to the person behind you and buy them a cup of coffee without Merry Christmas on it as well. And then guess what you could even say to them? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Shocking. Oh my gosh. It's almost like I came up with the idea to help, Right? It's super simple, right, guys? We can live generously, we can love others, and we don't need to write Merry Christmas on something to show that level of worship and attention towards Jesus. If we were a church that prioritized giving like Jesus, loving like Jesus, and worshiping like Jesus, because Jesus very much so got a way to worship his Father, what would that look like? As you guys are in gospel community this week, that's what we're gonna be talking about. We're going to be encouraging one another in gospel community this week. What are ways that we can worship God more fully in this season so we corporately can make much of Jesus together? I'm going to invite the band back up, and I'm going to pray that God would give us wisdom, that he would give us boldness, that he would give us clarity, so that we might, as his people, see a greater worship of Jesus making much of him because guess what guys he's worthy amen he is absolutely worthy he is absolutely worthy of a group of a hundred and some people living in Gainesville Florida turning their lives upside down and heading into the Christmas season to make much of him he's worthy of it he's worthy of your traditions that you have created over the last one two three four five six seven decades of your life He's worthy of turning those upside down to make much of him. Let's go before him and pray and ask that he might do this in our hearts so that we might make much of him. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you ask for greater worship from us, but that through your Holy Spirit, you also provide the means of grace and the power in our lives to know and experience and fulfill that command. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters in this building this morning, and Lord, I pray for those that couldn't be here, or whether they watch the podcast later or they talk to somebody that was here this morning. I pray that we would not hesitate to share that we're going to do something different this Advent season. We're going to make it about you. God, I ask that you would go ahead and prepare the grace that we need now to be forgiven for when we're not going to do that properly. We need that, Lord. And here's the beautiful thing is I know that you are faithful to forgive. But Lord, might we also experience your faithfulness and might we experience the joy that comes from obedience and making 
this time and this season about you. Worshiping you. Lifting high the name of Jesus. The baby born in a manger of humble means. The king of kings who surrendered his robe of glory in the highest places of heaven with the Father and took on human flesh, subjecting himself to death, even death on a cross, as Philippians chapter 2 tells us. May we use this season as a special time to reflect on your goodness and worship you. And Lord, may we also use it to declare your goodness to others so that others might worship you as well. God, we need you. We need you so that this goes beyond just a desire, that it goes beyond just words, that it goes beyond just intellectual assent, but that it moves our heart and our hands so that we might worship you more. As we take communion this morning, may we reflect on the flesh and blood poured out for us by your Son, Jesus Christ. And may we do that as an act of worship and return to our seats singing praises for Jesus. Our God, our King, our Deliverer, our Savior. Testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel in the likeness of his death and race to walk in newness of life.